Dude, and not even at all garbage. <laughs> all you can eat in the green room. <laughs> Let's go. All right. Marcy, he's excited to take pictures. He wants to stick one of the suppressors up his coolie. Yeah, it's actually going to fit perfectly. Um, he's going to take those photos. Oh, privates. <laughs> oh, you don't, you don't want him in the open? <laughs> Do you want it on like fans only pages? <sighs> premium Snapchat? Uh, Q has a premium snap. It's called, I sent him a, that picture I sent you is from your premium snap Q. What? The chocolate covered guy. Oh, dude. What oh. the fuck? Hold on. Where is it? I sent him this this morning. I go, I caught this photo of you. <laughs> That's great. Got that chocolate ring. Hey, the best part is he's taking it with like a digital camera cue. What? Guest. Today, uh, it's a hectic week. It's Olympia week, so we get a lot of crazy shit going on. There's also NASCAR in town. There's also been a ton of UFC fights, a lot of crazy shit going on. I know, Frank, Chocolate Rain. Chocolate Rain just introduced us. That's your new nickname, Chocolate Rain. So, I'm really excited about this today. We're going to get an update on all things UFC. We're going to get an update on all the cool shit going on. Right now, um, we have the Monster Energy NASCAR series, like I said. There's Olympia week this week. So I had to bring in um, one of my friends, one of the guys, uh, he's been a little bit of a mentor to me on the other side of things uh, with all things UFC and everything that I know nothing about. The Cuban Missile, Julian Marquez. What up, man, how are you doing today? I'm hanging in there. Yeah, hanging in there, I like it. I'm hanging in there, so one day at a time. So I'm really excited to have you on. I want to get into a little bit of your backstory about how you got into the UFC and have you build that out. Daryl, there's an echo cue. We're getting an update. Fix the echo. So I want to get into a little bit of your backstory and how you got to where you are, and then I want you to help fill us in on everything going on with you and what you have coming up. Echo but, uh, should be fixed, Daryl. Let me know. Yeah, let us know. Uh, so how did you get to where you are? Because you have kind of that little bit of a, I guess for lack of better words, rags to riches story to where you got to where you are now. So how did you get here? Well, um, it all started out whenever, uh, probably back in 2016, uh, I was accepting a fight in Bellator at the time, 
and I came out here for a camp. I did the camp in November, and uh, or I started my camp in November for a February fight, and uh, it just felt great to me. And me and my dad were talking. We're like, "Yo, let's uh, like we need to change some stuff up." The being back home, being in my comfort zone, wasn't where I needed to be. So we're like, "All right, this might be a place. Where let's look at it for somewhere to move." Eventually, I have some friends out here. They'll let me room with them. This, that, and the other. So end up going, taking my Bellator fight. I lost it, and the next day coming back home, you know, your family usually is like, "Oh, you lost, blah blah." When yeah. it's like, uh, yeah, like there's no pity party at my home. Then the Marquez household, it was, uh, "You need to get out." And I was like, "Oh," he goes, "You need to move. If you don't move now, you'll never leave." Take advantage of the opportunities, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. So he was just like, "Yeah, go leave." Um, so I left March, uh, I think March thirteenth. 2016 drove out to Vegas lived with some friends and just kind of built my story up from there taking short notice fights for Combates America and then getting a short notice fight against Matt Hamill which got me seen to see uh, Cameron Olsen in LFA and then that knockout that 66 second knockout got me a shot on the contender series now this is the first season of the contender series where no one knew anything about it. Everybody's trying to get their information. They're trying to contact the top uh, tier athletes and said, hey, you know, I heard you're on the contender series, but everything was hush. We were told not to say anything. It was going to be unraveled. And um, for some of you that don't know the contender series, it is five fights in one night where you have to perform in front of Dana White, Sean Shelby, Mick Maynard. And you have to perform to the point where they want to take you. You can't just win. And he's looking for guys that finish. I mean, I've been there. He's looking for big finishers, and he's looking for guys that are going to obviously draw a crowd and sell tickets. Yeah, they're gonna, they, they want people that are going to – they're going to be rising stars. These are the people that are going to help build the UFC, help build mixed martial arts into a, into a, a promising name. Like, everybody loves fighting. Like, for me, it doesn't matter – what type of fighter you are, I enjoy it. I enjoy seeing technique from the ground, from the stand-up, from the little transitions that you do. I love every little detail. But some people don't like those wrestlers, per se, the ones that ride and grind. They're called boring fighters, but necessarily I don't see them boring. I see them as masterminds to be able to do something to another person to where they can't you know, benefit off of it. They so can't build off of it. It sounds to me, well, back up to come forward. It sounds to me like you had this, you had a, you had a pretty good home structure. You had good, you know, parental supervision. You grew up in what, Kansas city. And, um, even though you had a terrible football team, but you had some good, we're the heart of America. Don't you? We're, <laughs> we're the heart of America. And the loudest stadium in the world. Where's your team at? New England, dude. We just win. <laughs> oh, fucking Christ. Don't get <laughs> him started on his team. <laughs> <He's Julie. laughs> you guys actually technically stole a B for my team. So seriously. You, you, <laughs> oh, so, shit. You had a good structure. Now, what advice would you give guys? Okay, this is a, this is important before we get to like the going forward, and I do want to get into the contender series and things like that. What advice would you give to guys that are like sitting at home and they're like, "Do I pack a bag and go?" So this is the type of th like your advice that I'm going to give you. It's not me. Method. I'm old. This is little Tommy sitting at sitting at home. So little Tommy. So the advice that I'd give out to athletes is. If this is who you want to be, you have to evolve your, your world around it. Like, it came to the point when I would work. I would only work to make money to pay for the gym. Right. I would work to make money to pay for uh, private lessons. I would work to not even – I didn't even care for living. And now, go stay there. No, I was going to say stay there for a second because I want people to get into this thought process. It's important. It's a means to an end, right? It's an A to B. Is there um, is there any like aha moment where like you can point to to say, hey little Tommy, you won your high school grappling, wrestling, whatever. That's a moment of reflection. Or like, is there an aha moment along the way that you could point people to, or is it just like you got to feel it and you got to go? No, there's no aha moment. So if you know my background, I started wrestling at the age of uh, I want to say twelve, thirteen. And a lot of my friends are high-level athletes. They're, you know, it, we grew up wrestling, and half my friends were multiple-time multiple state champions as children. They were 
you know, four-time state champions in high school, national champions in college. Like these guys, I, I was around, surrounded by success. And here I was that just made it to state and got pinned both uh, times in state. So I didn't even get a chance to even win one state match. Like if you looked at me and all my friend group, I wouldn't, I'm not supposed to be here. By the definition of success, I'm not supposed to be here. The only thing that I did different than everyone else is that I didn't stop. I didn't go in and, and sit there and like, you know, go off to college and, you know, become the successful athlete. I went off to college. It, it wasn't for me. And I just kept going. I, after I left college, I went straight into work at Red Robin, busting my ass at Red Robin, making two thirteen an hour and plus tips. And I would go to the gym and work out and mix martial arts, do that and do jujitsu and, and try to figure this game out. And I never stopped. I would train literally I want to say close to 40 hours a week worth of training on top of working on top of going to um, a, you know, Juco school. I love the fries there, though. Where? Red, Red Robins? Robins? Oh, hell yeah. So yum. I'm surprised you didn't hit me with that yum quote. Yum. Yeah. Every time I said Red Robin, I want to hear yum. Yum. We don't have Red Robin around here, do we? We have one in Summerlin, don't we? Yeah, I think I, oh. I think it's one or two. Here. I think you've been a time or two, Q. <laughs> I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy the fries. The fries, the steak fries, it's hard to get to. Dude, they're so delicious. Their burgers are smiling at you 24-7. They literally, that's their, their motto. Like, if your burger on the expo line. <laughs> the whole back room smiling, just erupted. If it's not smiling at you, they won't present it out. Like, if you get, you know when you look at McDonald's and they, like, have these See, pictures of them where they're, like, nice, but then you get them, they look like they've just been beaded on by a meat I'm hammer. glad we're talking about this because not enough people talk about this. Not enough. People talk about the grind. But not a lot of p people talk about the reality of the grind. Like, you're like, I worked at a fucking Red Robin. Like, a lot of people don't fully talk about, like, like you said, making ends meet to get to your goal. I've been around you. I've been to the Contender Series. You move and sit with some impressive people. You have some great coaches. You have some good people around you. You would never for a second think behind the scenes how much you bust your ass. Because you're out there and you're shaking the hands and you're kissing the babies and you're doing all the things you have to do to get yourself in the right position for success. You're putting successful people around you. I love that. But you're not afraid at the same time to turn around and say, I worked at a fucking Red Robin and I salted fries. That's what I had to do. But I feel like a lot of people get up on the mic or get on podcasts or get on this thing and they talk about, yeah, I was grinding it out for years and I lived in my car. But they don't get into the nuts and bolts of what it took to get to that point. I mean, there's a lot of years in there flinging trash in plain English. A lot of years. Yeah, I, I'm still in that. Yeah. I mean, you know, right now I, I work at but Top Golf and I love it. I love dealing with people. I love people, to be honest. When it comes to serving tables and stuff, I love having those short interactions for that hour, but, two hours. But time. in fairness to you, Julian, I got to say this. If you quit it all tomorrow, you've experienced a certain level of success that most people will never experience in the UFC. That's a fair statement. Yeah, I, we could say that. That's a fair statement. So regardless, you've reached a point where you've done some pretty great things. I'll never reach that level. I know like people like to say, don't say can't, and you could do this, and you could do that, and you could change the world. I'm almost 40 years old, okay? That's just the reality. I applaud you for that because I respect the shit out of people that can do things that I can't or maybe I didn't focus on through the years. And it takes a lot of work. It takes a grind. There's a lot of times, like people didn't see me when I was coming out here, you know, in the car, driving thousands of miles, going to the next stop, going to the next job, going to the next gig. It's a lot of work. And especially in the UFC, because the UFC still isn't one of those things. Like I've had Colby Covington on, I've had other people on, and they've discussed it. It's still not one of those places. You don't reach the big money fights for a while. It takes time. It takes a lot of time. Um, you know, I know there's not like necessarily an aha moment, but do you feel at least a sense of accomplishment at this point? Yeah, I definitely feel a sense of accomplishment. Like if we look at it, look at who I was and where I'm at right now, this is exactly on the line of where I want to be. And this is exactly defining who Julian Marquez is and on the process that I'm doing, you know, I I'm building podcasts, I'm building my own businesses, I'm building my my Instagram page with laughter, you know, I'm like a little funny type of guy, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm proud of what I'm doing because I'm doing everything I wanted to do. Yeah, it's going to take a struggle. It's going to be rough at first, and it's going to take a while to, to get this to where it becomes a successful income base to where I don't have to sit there and work at a, a serving job or have to sit there and, and drive medical patients around for uh, a couple extra dollars. This is... 
this is part of the grind, like that that cliche sign, the grind. Um, you have to put time in for the world to understand what you're doing, and then the world gives it back. Yeah, I mean, there's seasons for everything. Like we were talking a little bit about that before. I'm just, uh, you know, I guess the only um, thing sometimes I'll say that's somewhat religious. There's a time for everything. There's a there's a time for the grind. There's a time for, you know, the the work to pay off. There's a time to enjoy it. There's seasons for everything. You know, when I first came out here, I mean, literally, if you walked in my apartment right now, there's a bed, and I can have people attest to that. There's just the season I'm in right now is all I want to focus on is building and growing, and I don't want any of the traps of sitting at home and watching HBO and, and eating ice cream bars, even though I like ice cream. But, um, you know, for the most part, you all, we all reap what we sow. So it's kind of like you, you got to sow the seeds to build it. But nobody gets ahead on their own. You need help from your friends. You need to grow. You need help from your coaches. You need help from everybody around you. It takes a, it takes a village, as they say. So you have to put good people around you and you have to put the pieces in place. I wanted to have you on the podcast not just because I like you and I like rapping with you and you've been good to me, but I also love your insights into everything. You're a great communicator. You have an effective way of, of talking to people and bringing people together. And I think that's going to serve you even far beyond the, the fighting will, uh, not to take anything away from the fighting, but you have a tremendous way about you to work the room and to get around the room. And does that come from like your dad, like you mentioned? Does that come from just who you are? Is it just kind of like, because it comes very natural to you. Yeah, that, that actually comes um, to be able to work myself around the room to go around to people is the lack of fear that I have of putting myself out there. Um, you know, my dad always said, be nice to people. Um, or treat people how you want to be treated. And when someone walks into your home, you get up and shake their hand and introduce yourself. When you go into someone's home, you go directly towards them and introduce yourself. So when you're, you know, like you see me at the Contender Series, you know, I, I do work with them. So technically that is my home. So I always get up to shake people's hands. And then people that come in that I know, I want to keep those connections. I want to make sure they know that even though I'm busy, even though I have stuff going on, to keep that that personal connection that I have with them um, as much as possible. Because again, you know, trying to be somebody that's building a lot of things that you don't have this time to take out to sit there and have a 20 minute long text message or a phone call. You know, you have short time. So you go there, you talk to them, you move to the next and you make sure they know that they're comfortable. Like, hey, you know, Julian hasn't forgotten me or, you know, Julian's not that dick that I thought he was. You know, it's, I want people to know that. No matter what I can do, I can be there to help you out and to help build you and to help, you know, help you out in any way, shape, or form. Like you just offer it up, and and you know, like I, I look at it this way, okay. And this is why I give you so much credit. You know, whether it's guys like you, and even all the way up the chain in the UFC, it takes a lot of grind. And in the end, in this life. Whether you're 50, 60 years old, you'd be sitting at the dinner table, hopefully with, with some kids or some grandkids or whatever it is you want. It's all about sitting at that table and being able to have a conversation and have a good story. I'm pretty confident in my story at this point in my life and as I go forward and the people I've met and the things that I've done and the interactions I've had to understand that unless I'm sitting at a table with a fucking astronaut, I think I have a pretty good story. I think I've met a lot of great people along the way. I think I've forged a lot of really good relationships. And I think in the end, it's all about elevating your game and learning from those relationships. And if you're raised properly and you have good folks around you and you have good people around you, you'll be open to, to positive, good dialogue and being able to learn from those people. And it seems like you have and you have an ability to kind of just naturally get around that room. I think you're a fantastic ambassador to the sport. I think you'd be a great ambassador Thank to any you. brand. And I think you've done a great job kind of carving yourself out. I don't see anyone else around that contender series that works the room the way that you do. And you're not afraid to try everything, which is the key. And I think that's really a lot of advice to give some folks out there is don't be afraid to try different things. In the end, you know, don't be too gimmicky, but everybody kind of has a shtick and a gimmick and a thing that they that they kind of come back to what they're all about. And I think the most overused term is be real. Um, I think I think, you know, uh, people real recognizes real. And I think people will always brutal honesty will always win, I guess. But in the end, you're, you're always going to have your personality that's going to kind of come out. And I'm a bit of a goofball and, and deep down, I don't take myself seriously at all. And I think sometimes portrayed whether it's on social media or other things q will tell you you know it's like it's the wrong impression 
uh, I'm always willing to have like a very healthy dialogue about anything. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I'm willing to say like, I don't know, I don't see it that way or I see it this way. But I have my reasons for seeing it, you know, the ways that I see it. I think with you, you have a similar, a very healthy approach to everything. Like, hey, I'm going to go meet this guy. I'm going to go for my own opinion. I'm going to go enjoy the experience for what it is. And if they seem like they're good people, I'm going to put them in my circle or I'm going to invite them to this or I'm going to see what they're all about. And I'm going to get to know them. And that's, that's a bridge builder. I mean, yeah. that's what a bridge builder well, is. The thing is, too, you have to understand that everybody has some sort of insightful information. You know, at, at Top Golf, where I work, you know, I go and talk to um, the janitor or the porter, as we call it, and I sit there and talk to them, and I learn from them. They tell me, hey, man, you know, I wish I would have did this. Like, you got to focus on that. You got to do this. And I take their inside information because, again, they have had many years on this earth to where they've seen business. They've seen type of uh, different types of, you know, realities sure. that, that people presented them and they chose not to do it. Or they chose not to jump on it. Like how many of the people back in the day, they sat there and were like, man, I should have put stocks in Chipotle whenever it came out. Or, you know, I should have purchased, um, you know, stocks in, in iPhone or, or this. Like when we were sitting there flipping razors and we're like, this is going to be the next generation, a short type phone that was going to be the coolest thing and just slide in your back pocket. But then we have these iPhones, and look, we have these, like, top-level technology of iPhones that we sit here and, and take Instagram videos with or photos with like it, it was an actual camera. Now, speaking of this, you know where I'm going, Q. Uh, I knew. <laughs> I was waiting for it to come. All man. right, I'll wait. Julian, you didn't open up a door, bro. Let's open it. All right, let's go there. So... <laughs> I was going to ask you more about fighting because people are asking me about fighting stuff, but we'll come back to fighting. We'll circle it. So about this technology stuff, is it natural or unnatural? A little green is it from man, this Julian, earth? little green man. This is the thing. It is technically it's unnatural because we spent since the beginning of time, we didn't have technology. We created it as humans. We advanced ourselves. But did we do it? Did we? Uh, I mean, I didn't do it. I can speak for that. Some dude, some dude that's really smart. Is he from this it. world? I mean, his mind could be out of this world, to be honest, if you look at it like that. Did he land in a spacecraft? When it comes to that, I, I can't. I, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in little spacecraft aliens that flew over here. It doesn't make sense. Q, we have a non-believer. So oh, I, I missed, wish you would have oh, cued in that oh, song, by the way. He didn't believe. He, not no. You're the first non-believer in here. Wow. Of aliens. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just there are other life forms, but I don't think it's the type that they keep portraying out there and and showing these like little metal tin spacecrafts. Like if we're on Mars <laughs> attacks that man, come out here, yeah. Mac, 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 mac. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely that. believe that there's aliens. Yeah, there could be. I mean, an alien can come in any shape or any shape or form it could be a bacteria it could be any of that and but oh like ghosts of mars i didn't even think of that cue remember that uh, dude with uh, the weird uh, fangs oh, yeah yeah you're talking about ghosts of mars with the ice cube yeah with ice uh, that yeah. was so bad he had the the, the twin were they the solid that's, gold or the stainless Q, pull carpenter. up a picture that's yeah john carpenter pull up a picture movie, of ice cube right? and ghosts of mars mars attack should have won an oscar show me those uh, he, oh it had everybody in it he had those ak's the dual ak's with the um were they stainless or were they gold were they el chapos no, they were stainless. They weren't they were, gold. They were like stainless. What was it called? Uh, Ghosts of Mars. Ghosts of Mars. John Carp. I forgot about that. It could be a virus. Yeah. And if it's a virus, it could infect us, and then I'll look like that you crazy guy with the ponytail. Take over our bodies, and we start, like, carving Car ourselves in there. I, I want to cut on, like, I'll stab myself in the head, but I'll still live, but I'll be kind of a zombie, but not really a zombie, but I'll have, like, this weird butcher knife in my head, and then I'll attack people. Yo, what about the dude that threw the flying disc? Those like little razor discs that just look at this motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> dude, this just first of all, clean. first of all, where did he get camo pants that match the terrain of Mars? Dude, it's Ice Cube. He gets whatever. He look wants. at this guy. Does That's he gonna... got John Stamos in there. Stamos is yeah, in this. Look at it. That's Stamos. Yeah. No. Is that Stamos? Can we confirm that? Or Jason Statham, my bad. St I was going to say, I thought the bad guy was Stamos. I'd be like, that's amazing. <laughs> no. You would have seen me fucking jump out a window. No, it would have been great. But, like, dude, that movie's great. But that's the thing. It's like, 
And it had that chick, that alien, that chick who played an alien in like every movie, Natasha Henstridge. Yeah. What happened to her Q? I think That's she she was smoking hot. Yeah, back in the day she was, but I think like I think like Ghost of Mars was her last movie that was like her end all be all, and then she no realized, way she like, went oh, to like shit. Lifetime or something. She's probably doing Lifetime movies. It could be she should have a talk show. Yeah, or she's something. doing shit you don't know nothing about. Yeah, that's but true. I'm going home and I'm watching that tonight. Oh, good. that's Dude. when Ice Cube was gangster. Oh, yeah, that's right. She was uh, that was the species chick. Oh. Yeah, she was naked in species. Naked, naked, fucking oh, yeah. naked. Did that move? Species came out after Ghost of Mars. No, before she did Species so? one, two, and three. In part nine. <laughs> and part nine <laughs> direct to yeah. video that's hilarious no the the thing is when it comes down to like technology i i can't confirm or deny like you gotta sit there and think of steve jobs as a brain that most people will never achieve he created a technology and even if you look at uh let's go to uh jeff bezos um captain money he he sat there and created a uh, a platform for you to buy sell flip and trade on Amazon, and these people deliver it to your house faster than you are basic FedEx or he looks like Arnold now. USPS. He looks savage. Oh, I haven't, I haven't seen him at all. Yeah, if you look at a picture of Bezos, like when he first hit the scene, and then you look at him now, he's wouldn't, like ripped. Wouldn't you? You're, you're literally ha don't have to worry about anything. You can never work a day in your life. You could just work out, and you can buy that, that, that. Well, he's single again, man. He's, is he really? He's on the hunt. Yeah, yeah, you know, you didn't hear that. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a Mac Daddy. Now, How much bro? did he have to pay her? Half. Oh, the world. No, not half, dude. No, it was seriously. Freaking, yeah, let me pull that shit up, bro. It was like boy, boy didn't have a prenup, and he got taken half. No, she's the richest. She's the richest divorcee in the history of the of the world. Is that real? Yeah, look, you didn't know about that. Yeah, no, no, but I didn't know. Like, I, I. Dude, he had to have a prenup. I mean, come on, he's Captain Moneybags. Did you see him before he had money? Yeah, but I don't think he was uh, Moneybags whenever they back met. Then, yeah. Yeah. Back then, maybe no. He's Yeah, she. he... Oh, my God. He gave her $38 billion. What? Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to find her. That's Fuck like Bru that. bro. That's like Brewster's millions. You couldn't spend that kind of money. <laughs> no. You couldn't if you spent a million a day. You couldn't spend that kind of money. I'm trying to be her boy toy. Yeah. Oh I'm, my I'm god. I'm it. I'm for sale. Hey, do you need a sugar baby? Uh, Seriously. I'm here. <laughs> oh my god. For sale. Thir is billion. that a real number? Thirty-eight billion. Billion. Yeah. Billion. I think you need to bring the pinky up to the mouth billion. when you yeah, say. Yeah. Right. Oh <laughs> my god. <laughs> So anyway, let's jump back to fighting for a second. So one guy, I want to want to get to Daryl's question because it's a decent one. Yeah. Um, when you go into the octagon, do do you have a hate for the fighter or just there to do what you have been taught to do? What's natural? So it's crazy. Everybody has hate, and there's like different people. Like when you look at like Ben Askren and Jorge Masvidal, you can feel the hate in that. You know, they'll never go, like he said, they'll never go into a grocery store and not have beef. If you look at Conor McGregor versus Habib, they both have beef for life. They, you know, they'll never be nice to each other. But to me, this is business, man. I don't, when I look at it, I go like the old school Bruce Lee style where he said, you know, you can't have anger in your mind. If you have anger, you can't control yourself. So when I go in there, that is the most at home and the most relaxed and the most myself I ever am. That's the only time where I can release the true Julian, the true um, inner self that I have that you can't really release out there. It's, it's, it's almost comfortable. Like when you're driving for, you know, 18 hours and you finally get on your, you're on a vacation for a week and you're driving 18 hours and you finally get home, you know that feeling when you lay down in your bed, you're just like, I'm fucking happy to be home. That's know? that's some Bruce Leroy shit right there. Yeah, that's my that's my lifestyle. Like when I go in there, like there's nothing that you can do to take me off my game. You know what I mean? There's nothing that you can do to alter my mind. Like when I'm in there, you have a different person that comes out. I, I will say I will say this to Daryl. Like I'll I'll say this when you get to the professional levels of anything, there's so much that goes into it. Hate is just one small component. Um, there's film, there's so many different things that you're breaking down now because too much is on the line. It's not like you're just like crawling in a cage like like Wolverine and you're just like, Rah, you know, there's a uh. lot, you know, there's a lot being broken down in all of these things. I've seen a, enough behind the scenes of all things, professional sports, all sports. There's so much that goes into it. Hate will only take you so far. 
It's not enough. Yeah. Um, you, you're going to train a thousand hours. Am I, I'm right in saying that, Julian, yeah. as far as the UFC goes. You're going to break a ton of film down. You're going to become a little cerebral about it. You're going to watch fighters' tendencies and styles, especially if you have the opportunity to study tape and especially if you have the opportunity to study up on the fighters. So there's going to be a lot of components. Yeah, and that, that helps out nowadays with technology that was made by the aliens. Um, they help you, like the UFC Fight Pass, uh, YouTube, all this stuff has helped, you know, Put these people, put other fighters out there on a platform. Yeah, to there's where tape you can out see there. Yeah. yeah, you could see them. And it's easy to see it, but, um, you know, you train countless hours for the same repetition because you don't have a time to think. In, in a fight, you don't literally have time to see. When someone's coming at you with 100%, like, trying to finish you or trying to hurt you, you don't have time to sit there and think, be like, oh, man, this dude called me an idiot. Or this dude said that, you know, my beard sucks. Yeah, you know, it's, di like, it's different than football in the sense that, like, when you line up in football, you have time across the line to, you know, especially at the, the high school and college level, talk a little shit, spit a little garbage. It's, it's you know, you do that in the pre-fight stuff, but you kind of get over it. And like you said, you settle into a groove. Yeah. But tell me a little bit about what's going on in the UFC right now because there's so many cool divisions, and I know so little about it. I know enough about it to be dangerous because I really don't pay attention the way I should. Um What's going on? What's the most exciting division? What's been what's been going on in the news of the UFC that people got to know about? Because I, I need you to kind of take us through a little bit of what you see going on out there. Uh, dude, right now there's so much going on. I mean, we have Robert Whitaker versus Israel Adesanya coming up in Melbourne uh, here in a couple weeks. And that right there is going to unify the interim title that Israel Asanya just won. And he's finally going against uh, Robert Whitaker, which is the first person Robert Whitaker has faced outside of Yoel Romero. And let's just talk about Yoel Romero mm -hmm. for a quick second. If you look at Yoel Romero right now, obviously he's like 40 years old. He looks like a, a Greek god, like the replicas that we looked at in the, in the history books to see what they what Zeus would look like or his creation. So this guy is completely put together at the age that he is and he is only lost 3 times, twice to Robert Whitaker and once to, to Paulo Costa that just recently happened. But if you take those decisions away, he didn't get knocked out, he didn't get finished. If you take those decisions away, Yoel Romero is probably the greatest middleweight fighter of all time. You have to sit there, and you 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 can't battle that because he lost to close decisions. Some arguably that he won, and they were decided by three different people that could have had the wrong cup of coffee that day, or their Cuban ca uh, Cuban cafe was burnt, and they were oh, pissed off. That, you know, like their little cosadito was messed mm -hmm. up, so they had a little bit of hatred, and it could have altered the decision on the angle that they were sitting. So you take away those three fights and you give him the wins, he could arguably be the greatest middleweight of all time. And then there's the welterweight division, which is fucking crazy. The welterweight division never stops. You have Colby Covington that was supposed to face Kamar Usman, and recently something happened in there where the they're deal, not going to The deal face. fell through, yeah. But now we got the B, you know, the badass motherfucker the title. You know, George Jorge Masvidal versus uh, Nate Diaz, which is the East Coast versus the West Coast. This. This is going to be the great I, I got to lean man. toward, you know I got the homies in Miami, so I got to lean towards Georgie on that oh, one. Yo, look, I love the Diaz brothers, but at the end of the day, man, Jorge Masvidal is Cuban, and I've always, I'll have always yeah. stick on a Cuban side, man. I'll you never know, go on my, a different my, way. My Cuban relationships run deep. Yo. Yeah, Georgie's, Georgie's just a straight punk. I love it. You know what I mean? He's yeah. Just, yeah, he's just so gangster right now, and I love that he's having like that strong second half of his career. Like it's kind of like he's coming into his own, and he had that great run in the beginning, kind of stalled out, was nowhere to be found for a little while, was kind of floundering, and I think he had like two losses in a row at one point or something like that. Yeah, you know, he was doing his little TV show. Yeah. He was stuck on a TV he, show he, for he, a year. He had and some half. things going on, and then he's now having this resurgence, and I just love it because it's like almost like a, a new repackaged fighter, and every day it's something exciting, and it's a lot of fun. Um, so the welterweight division is fucking crazy. Uh, talk to me, because a lot of people don't know, what is the difference between interim title, actual title holder? Like, what are these belts, and what do they mean? So the interim title, like, I don't, I don't believe in that shit. Like, it's, it's just like a ribbon, you know what I mean? Pers participation ribbon, like, right. which is stupid. Um, but 
say like your your um, champion at the time at the present moment is injured or hurt or cannot fight where what you saw with Robert Whitaker Robert Whitaker had to have surgery emergency surgery the day before uh, or the day after weigh-ins on his last bout when he was supposed to fight Yoel Romero um, so that fight still had to be set but then Robert Whitaker or then Israel Asanya had to fight Kevin Gaslam so instead of giving the the new title of like the top contender they give out an interim belt to pretty much you know have someone saying hey you're the top contender you're the uh the uh champion and then whenever they face the linear champion the winner of that becomes the real true champion so it's just kind of a placeholder but if that's the case you know then tony ferguson got screwed out of a lot of it because he should have challenged for the belt way long before um habib did way long before uh dustin poirier did I, I heard an interesting concept. I want to get your thoughts on it. A lot of people liked the old UFC, which it was tournament style and anything goes. I think that's a little extreme. I think you have to have weight classes. And I yeah, think like you're straight yeah. I think Thunderdome that's, style. Yeah, I think that's a little much. But somebody did make an interesting deal. I saw on a, on a board. They said because everybody was clamoring to see the light heavyweight and heavyweight fight for a long time, John Jones and... Um, and what's his face? Stipe? Uh, no. Well, Brock Stipe Lesner. now, or, or any of those guys. Brock Lesnar, DC. Would be, DC would be exciting. But pick any of them. But I liked the idea of kind of sometimes joining the brackets, light, heavy, and heavy, and having like a, like a supreme champion. Um, maybe you join welterweight and something. You know, it, I mean, what do you think of that? Like the concept of getting not to a tournament style, but maybe once a year almost having like a WrestleMania or a Starcade or something. You know, it'd be cool, but tournaments don't work, man. Yeah. The tournaments don't work. You have a lot of followers. Like, shout out to PFL. They're doing great at their tournament right. style. But there's, like, injuries. There's people that miss weight. There's certain things that happen that alter the tournament and switch. And so when you have a tournament, like, and PFL does it, and they do a great job of this, it's more like, you know, if you miss weight and I miss weight and we're supposed to go here, well, we're both scratched from the card, and the two people that made weight are now fighting each other. So your whole entire – um, your whole entire tournament time, can get you know, it, got, it switches, but you were just training. I was just training for somebody else the entire fight, and then the last day I switched to a new person. But since you're fighting in a tournament, it doesn't matter who you fight. You need to be the best and prove that you're the best. So um, it, 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 it's good, but honestly, man, like styles make fights, and if you don't put styles together, you won't be as entertained. Like, look at this. If we didn't put Ben Askren together with uh, Jorge Masvidal, we wouldn't have had that exciting fight that we just had or that memory that we all share. If we would put Ben Askren or Jorge Masvidal into the next lineup, if we would put him against Colby Covington or if we would have put him against Kamar Usman like everybody was saying because he just knocked out the title challenger at 170, it would have not been as impressive or we wouldn't have had the result that we had. You know, if you look at when it came to grapplers, Jorge Masvidal did suffer when he fought Damian Maya, which, again, another title challenger. He lost to Damian Maya in a decision, but he was having struggles with the, the grappling of Damian Maya. So then you put him with Kamar Usman or Colby Covington, who are just going to sit there and try to wrestle and grind him. It's not going to be as exciting. Even though Ben Askren would have tried to do the same thing, mm. Ben Askren has he's a one-trick pony. He is a wrestler. He is only a wrestler. And when it comes to standing, if you put him in a boxing ring or you put him in an MMA cage and said, hey, you could throw everything, but you cannot take anybody down, you're going to see his level of striking change. So that style makes fights. The Dustin Poirier versus Max Holloway. Max Holloway coming up to 55 to try to challenge Dustin Poirier. That was a stylistic matchup. People want to see that. People don't want to see, um, you know, people don't want to see certain matchups that are there like, it's not that there'll be bad matchups. They just won't have that exciting pop to it. They right. won't have that tell. They won't bring yeah. that story along. With what it. do you think? You know, I asked Nick this from Jiu-Jitsu. So uh, I had him on, and I've asked uh, other people this question. I read a really interesting thing, and there's a, it's an article on YouTube that gets into, um, I think it was uh, Superfoot said this. He said, you know, I love the UFC. I love what they're doing. And this this is way before Dana and everything else. It's like the first couple of UFCs. But he said what the Gracies did, and I know we're big jujitsu guys, is he said they stacked the deck in those first two UFCs to to make jujitsu 
what it is today. What we view jujitsu as today is one of the that and a combination of Muay Thai and wrestling are kind of like your supreme deals. He said, but they stacked the deck. They, they, if you go back and you watch those first two UFCs, all the opponents were basically flawed opponents that they went up against and they were able to easily kind of go through. And that a lot of guys that have come forward now that wanted to be in UFC 1 and 2 weren't necessarily allowed into it or were kind of set up to almost fail in the card because of styles. Um, either way, it worked, right? Like Nick at yeah. the end of the day was like, you know, it all paid off. What do you say to that, you know, um, that they stacked the deck in the first couple of UFCs? So the thing is, is when it's one of one, you know what I mean? You have to sit there and do trial and error. Like the Contender Series 1 was completely different. The Contender Series 1 was not, um, Season 1 was not an episode, or it was not a show. It was a straight, like, meat locker, man. Mm -hmm. you, you were inside of this facility that they don't have anymore that had stain or they had stainless steel benches like bleachers that you would have on a football field at a little kids league sitting there alongside on top of mats where the tough finale or the tough you know training deal when they have two different coaches teaching them and you have the ultimate fighter that was there so they have their production team everything inside this little gym inside of a 25 foot octagon that you would go in there and i'm telling you this is in the middle of the summer where it is completely hot, man. You have no AC when it's 100 degrees mm. outside inside of this giant warehouse with a bunch of cameras, a bunch of people. You're sitting there sweating, and the lights, everything is hot. So you go in there, and you battle it out. It now has been – we're on season three, and it's, it's perfecting the flaws that it had prior, and it's building it up. So – when you talk about UFC 1, they had to throw something out there. They had to put something together. They had to put yeah. something together, and, and it didn't matter. You, you want to benefit the people that are going to be there to help build your star. You need to build a star because if you don't build a star, then it becomes nothing. Interesting. In time, you know, you know, I always say, like, in time, everything looks, you know, from a 1,000 feet, you can critique the shit out of everything. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah, I mean, if you go back and you look, there was, like, a sumo wrestler in there. <laughs> it was some weird oh, shit. Oh, yeah. They had, you know, um, some of the greatest iconic fights that we see today Day on the highlight reels or when you YouTube um, the UFC, you'll see some crazy ass stuff like, you know, when they used to kick each other in the nuts, man, or just like <laughs> people would literally be in guard and just straight uppercut ball sack. Oh, that's so funny. I That is so funny. Um, on another note, I got a question here. Guys, this is actually a good question. It threw me off for a second. Who do you want to see fight? Like, what's your dream fight you'd like to see right now? If you had to pick one, man, if you, if you could make, if you could be a booker for a day, who would you book? Um, can I pick more than one? Two. Don't get crazy. Don't get crazy. Okay, two. We'll be all here right. All day. So this is what I would like to do. I would like to see Yoel Romero versus Israel Adesanya. Um, I would like to see that one. You know, even though Yoel has came up short on some stuff, that right there is a great stylistic matchup for both people. Two strikers, um, one counter, one offensive. It, not only that, it just that's going to be a highlight reel. Uh, and then, you know, right now, I, I, I got to see Habib versus Tony Ferguson. Dustin Poirier's last bout where Dustin, you know, wasn't able to stop the takedown of Habib, but he was able to put him in a dangerous guillotine. That right there shows something that's like, oh, man, Tony's just a wild, creative person that could pull something off in that, that area. Or even if he's down on the ground, Habib can learn how to, or Tony can learn how to get off the back, or he he likes being on the his back. So it's just that stylistically is what I want to see. Let me ask you this: This is kind of stems off of that. Is is John Jones now in that echelon of, you know, a guy who is one of the best fighters across the board? You know, when we start to talk about like boxers. MMA, you know, getting into like the history of fighting in general. Is John Jones in that echelon now? Has um, he done enough? You know, John Jones is always going to be in the in everybody's heads. It doesn't matter. Um, everybody knows him for one thing or the other, and you know, you can't argue him. Like they're trying to overturn the Matt Hamill fight where he gave a twelve to six elbow on Matt Hamill, and, and Matt couldn't continue. So they gave him a, a loss when it should just be disqualification, no contest. But the guy has defeated everyone. Yeah, I mean, it, people have criticized, you know, and we, I've heard this before in other sports. They talk about Gretzky with all the goals and playing in the dead goalie era. They talk about all these different things. He's beat everyone that's been put in front of him, essentially. 
right? With the exception of a DQ or a loss, however you want to classify it. And I think it should be a DQ. DQ yeah. is different. It should be a DQ. Um, depending on the state, the governing body, how they ruled it, whatever, it is what it is. I'm not saying it should be wiped from his record, but it should be like a DQ. Yeah, it's just no contest. It just is what it is. Um, but I think he's beat everybody in front of him. And he sure as shit has tried to challenge anybody in front of him, too. Um, you know, he's had his, his back and forth with even the heavyweight guys. I put him in that echelon now of he has to be regarded as one of the better fighters of all time. I mean, he's got the longevity. He has the record. He's, you know, for better or worse, held the belt, you know, through good times and bad. Um, even when he wasn't the champ, he was still regarded as the champ. You know, I think he's done the damn thing to the level. You know, Q's not a big UFC guy, but he'll tell you, like, he knows John Jones. Yeah. And he's transcended the game a little bit. You it's know? uh J so John Jones is always gonna have that that name. And John Jones, you know, granted all the stuff that had happened to John Jones on the backside has actually helped him out in his career a lot more because it didn't cost him all of the extra brain damage or the fights. You know, you can't you can only have fights like the uh Alexander Gustafson fight, you know, one time, one or two times in your career before it starts damaging you. I mean, look at I mean, look at Alistar Overeem. If you hit him in the right spot, the dude's, you know, looks like he's almost going to die. I, and I think the UFC's starting to dial it in a little bit better in terms of, like, you're seeing guys now have longer careers because they're managing the fighters a lot. I mean, the management's come a long way. And it's not like, it, you know, I mean, they have enough rules in place now and sto the stoppages are good where you're getting to that point where guys are able to have 30, 40, 50 fight careers. Where in the beginning it was kind of scary. Like, you might get seven, eight fights in. <laughs> you know, you might, you know, it, it, I'm laughing, but it, you could have a scary future. Yeah, actually, um, a career to look at is, uh, I love the guy, you know, but Jake Ellenberger. If you watch Jake Ellenberger, he was supposed to be the top-tier athlete. This guy came in, and he was destroying everybody. I mean, he has remarkable wins. He was, like, on a seven-fight win streak, and then he went against Mark Campman. And Mark Campman hit him with one of these knees that would have knocked out anyone in the UFC, and it would have knocked – over a brick building like this thing was so devastating it knocked out um jake ellenberger and since then he has not been right you know his fighting career wasn't able to get back to where it needed to be and you hit him in the jaw it, it was it was done it was time for him to stop like anytime he got hit with any type of pressure or a hard hit by anybody didn't matter if you're a heavy hitter or not it it destroyed him because you know, he took all these heavy fights and he went with somebody that he probably shouldn't have mm. where the stylistic wasn't a perfect and matchup. And that's, that's more management. I mean, that's just managing his career a little bit better. Well, I mean, I, could it be management? Could it be the, the UFC wanted it? We'll never know because we weren't there in that conversation. But I could tell you, you know, there's people that they want to push and there's people that they want to get in there. And management, you have the right to say yes or no, but, you know, the UFC is going to come to you and be like, hey, man, you're on a good win streak. Like, Let's put you up against this guy. Like, we think you're going to do a good fight. It's going to be a great fight. That, those two fighters at the time, Mark Campman and, uh, you know, Jake Ellenberger, those two fighters at the time were the top ones. They finally met each other. Could you have went altered paths to where they build them up a little bit more? You could have, but instead they both went there, and the winner of that fought Carlos Condit, and Campman ended up fighting twice. And then, uh, you know, that that's how it goes, man. Like, if you don't control your career, someone else will. Right. No, and, that's a good point. And, you know, they're going to always ask you. The UFC will always ask you to fight somebody. Or you can present a fight to them, and it's better to present it to them and not wait for them to give you the opportunity. Talk to me for a, a quick second, and we'll get back to, to you and some things I want to get to. But talk to me about the women's division for a quick second. Man, it's on fire right now. Uh, there's so many things that are altering. China just had uh, their first... You know, UFC champion, uh, Willie Zhang, and she had a dominant performance over Jessica Andraj, which, you know, Jessica Andraj has been sleeping everybody and destroying everybody. When she went against Rose Namanudis, no one saw that lift where she was going to get slammed on her head and knock out Rose. Rose was winning that fight, and then Jessica Andraj came out and won. So then she ends up finishing all these people, and then she ends up getting finished. We now have a new prospect. We now have somebody else that's like, Holy shit. And then um, we still have Joanna John Jacek is still coming back and she's trying to fight uh, Michelle Watterson happening in a couple of weeks. 
And that's another person that you want to look out for. Joanna almost had the title uh, contentions as Ronda Rousey. She almost had the longevity of being a champ. She was just like one win away, and Rose Namunina stopped her. So she's trying to get back. She's the girl that's trying to get back what she had before. Is it is it nice to have in that women like I struggle with this because I don't know the answer. Is it is it good to have in that women's division like one supreme champion where it's kind of like this is the person and this is the face like for years we we we've had Ronda, we've had different people in that slot. Or is it better to kind of have that revolving door and spice it up and, and you know, you maybe have somebody who defends the title a couple times and then they drop it to someone else? What, what do you think is better for UFC? Well, the thing is, is that you have to understand that the, the UFC just put in the women's division, what, like 10 years ago? Yeah, it's still fresh. It's brand new. And if, you, if we're going to talk about like UFC 1 or the beginning of UFC, we're 25 years old, you know, a little over 25 years old. And the beginning fights of our career, there was that one dominant, you know, UFC star or those dominant UFC people. And they had to slowly, like, evolve. And, and every year we evolved. It was a wrestler. It was a boxer. It was a jiu-jitsu. It was back to the wrestler. And it was the blend. And now we're starting to see a blend. So now that UFC and MMA itself has been growing, the women's division, when it first started, it was a one-trick pony. It was a one-style. And it went jiu-jitsu. So, you know, Ronda Rousey was taking everybody out in jiu-jitsu, taking out all the wrestlers, and then it became a little bit of the strikers, and now it's becoming the heavy hitters like Amanda Nunez. So to answer your question, the revolving door is going to happen whether whether or not they, they want to have it or not. Um, the female that's most dominant right now is Amanda Nunez, and that's because she's knocking some of the greatest historic fighters that are in the female division out. I mean, she knocked out um chris cyborg in the first round which no one saw she went up in weight she came down and she's finished you know holly home who has fought every single champion and is the only person to dethrone you think we'll get a chance to see her in valentina again uh you know i would like that i think that'd be a great a great fight that was probably that right there is valentina is one of those girls that has it all she has a striking yeah she i mean she's been competing since she was a kid and they've learned how to blend it. And mixed martial arts now is not just a one-trick style pony. I mean, you could be really, really good like Habib, where he's able to grab a hold of you and hold you down, but he has a certain way. It's a blend. It's not really wrestling, and it's not really striking. But if you look at Colby Covington, Colby Covington will take you down. His striking isn't the best, but he takes you down, tires your arms out, and then when he gets up, he puts a lot of volume and punches on to where he's blending his wrestling, his you know, his uh, striking, everything all together. Yeah, I explained it to somebody about Colby because Colby and I have a bit of a relationship. I explained it, you know, him and Robbie went at it and people were like, yeah, but his punches. And I said, yeah, but those are like aggravating punches. He's keeping, you know, you away and, and he's aggravate. He's taken some of Robbie's game away in doing that. Yeah, he- well, you don't chop a tree down with one blow. You're not, you know, Paul Bunyan. When you chop a tree down with an axe, you have to sit there and... and hit it you know a few hundred times a few yeah, you know probably, probably a thousand times yeah you know because he's he's been there he's 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 seen it so it's it's an exciting time in the ufc let me ask you this too we'll, we'll dead the ufc thing get back to you but um what's the one thing you'd like to see the ufc change in the short run like what do you think will take it to the next level because there's still bellator flowing out there there's some other other leagues and i liken it to uh ufc is the supreme i mean we all know that Bellator and other things, you know, it. you have to respect the PFL. There's a lot of other things out there. But what's the one thing you think the UFC should do next to make it like the, the big leap, another leap forward? Because it's always done it. I mean, now with the ESPN Plus, and I know everybody complains about the stream and things like that, but it's getting better. They're doing things to make the fan experience better. The, the Contender Series is really dialing in. What's the next thing you'd like to see them do to take it to the next level? Or is it coming? And we so, don't know. Well, I, I think it's coming. Um, we haven't really they, – they're not opening it up. Um, you know, whenever – I think they're going to bring in boxing. They're going to start have UFC and boxing, um, Zufa-style boxing, which has been talked for years. And having a boxing promotion that's brought to you by the UFC is going to put a little bit of money behind it and build up a lot of these, you know, these boxers where people say boxing is dead. It's not. It's just not getting the type of publicity that it needs. But honestly, right now, what everyone else is not really doing is cross-promoting. 
You know, if we look at this and we take it in the Instagram realm, everybody wants to take photos with themselves and themselves and try to become famous. But to be honest, they suck. Like, no one gives a shit to look at my photos. Like, I, I post, like, fake nude photos where blurred out images because people think it's funny and it's hilarious. I like the nudes. But they're, they're totally cool, you know? Follow me on Instagram, J Marquez MMA. <laughs> Comment below. Anyways, uh, it, it's it's like... No one cares, but when I post a photo with another influencer or another person that people want to see, that, yeah, there you they are. They want to oh, see your combined. Yeah, there we yeah, go. Look at that, baby. There he is. You know, just over there, just doing my thing. Having but I, fun. you know, I think, I think. See, I've said this before, Julian. Like, I think Instagram's a flawed platform. No, it's fake. It's one hundred percent fake. It's a flawed platform, and I try to tell people this all the time. I'm like, Instagram bets on how much you're willing to swipe down, and the issue I have with Instagram is, and I've had this talk with Jay Cutler, I've had this talk with other very high, much larger followed accounts than, than me. I have an issue with it from the standpoint of it's the here and now and it's the one best photo you happen to have in your phone that you're gonna put up that you think's gonna do well. But I think you're absolutely right. People wanna see collaborations, people wanna see fun stuff, people wanna see people doing things together and doing things in a homogenous, fun atmosphere. Yeah, I yeah. think, you know, I, like I said, the minute I st people talk about being real, the minute I started posting pictures, that was what I really do in a day, which is sit here, do the podcast, do different things. People, you know, I mean, it became they don't, they're like, wow, uh, it's not that, ex you know, and, you know, like I, I hang out with a lot of cool people. I meet a lot of cool people, but I'm not going to post like, yeah, here's me and like, you know, here's my tricep and here's my picture in front of the, the, the mirror. It, it gets old. I mean, I, I you got to hype it up. You got to create it. It's, it's a, it's a gimmick. It's a fake personality, even though like you can represent yourself through the words that you put underneath the caption. But in, in all actuality, today's everything's evolving. You know, it was, it was Xanga, which most people don't know. And then the next thing was MySpace. The next thing was Twitter, then fa or Facebook, then Twitter, then Instagram, um, then Snapchat. Then it's it's always fluctuating, and now it's you know, it, the next thing is called TikTok. TikTok is like the old school Vine, you know, where where people are bringing this up. It, it's people are attracted to short films. They have the attention spans of a squirrel, and they want to see the people that they look at. And they want to see them collaborate and, together. And that's what I think is going to hold Instagram back is that inability to really transfer a video. The platform's just not geared for it. People say, well, why do you say that? And I say, well, if Instagram's owned by Facebook and Facebook managed to fuck up Facebook, I think at, at some point they're going to fuck up my, uh, MySpace. They're yeah, sooner or later it's going to – It's it, everything evolves. Everything changes. Everything has its seasons like we said at the beginning of this podcast. But if you look at it, um, Instagram – Instagram's doing great, and it's going to evolve, and it's getting better. I mean, you know, five years ago, we didn't have IGTV where we could put, you know, longer forms of uh, video up and to build that awareness. So, you know, to circle back to what the UFC is going to do or what they can do is cross-promote. And what I mean by cross-promote is when they start getting other athletes or getting involved, like as you saw in Dubai or Abu Dhabi this past weekend, 2 Chains was there sitting next to Dana White. Like that is a, another person that you're like looking at, you're like, oh man, 2 Chains. I haven't seen 2 Chains in forever. Or you look at Bob Menery, if you guys follow um, Instagram, Bob Menery does a uh, voiceover commentary for you know football clips, fight clips, or you know golf clips, just any sports clips. He puts some hilarious uh, voiceovers. But he was on there, and he has a big platform, which is starting to reach these different type of people that are you know following him and that don't really watch the UFC. But it, when you start collaborating and bringing other you know influencers, actors, actresses, musicians. Um, and you start mixing it up with them. NFL players, you know, like we're going to start seeing football players and UFC athletes, UFC athletes showing up to football games, uh, hyping them up, doing stuff like that. And then vice versa, football athletes are going to come over to the UFC, hype up the UFC. And we just had The Rock, you know, Jorge Masvidal called out The Rock and said, hey, man, <laughs> when I win this deal, I want you to put the title on my waist. And he's like, you know, I'm working on it. I'll see if I have, you know, The Rock responds. He's going to try to make it. And if he can, he's going to strap him up. And it's like right there, you just remove Dana out of this and you put in somebody with a giant following with more of a following than the UFC, than the NFL. This is a big person that mo everybody loves. And then 
you now have another branch of um, exposure through The Rock. I think The Rock has like 56 million Instagram followers. Yeah, he's like the second largest dude. I think it's... Um, like personally or yeah, just on Instagram? I think he's the second largest he's dude on Instagram, dude. you know, in terms of like following. I think the biggest is that soccer player. What's his name, Q? You know the soccer guys. What, fucking uh, Cristiano? Yeah, Ronaldo, I think, is the largest follow male. Yeah. It's Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. But, like, even then, like, bring him over. Because you're now going, we're, we're now going in different countries. We're taking, um, we're, we're opening the eyes of different countries. We put Shanghai in there. Now you have China that's going to build teams for, you know, MMA athletes to help, you know, build up the, the country as well as the vision. And China has way more people than anywhere else. Oh, China's on everybody's radar. I think you have to you have to make moves into China. I like seeing what they're doing in Abu Dhabi. I think that's huge. And if you look at what the WWE's done in in Abu, in Abu Dhabi and in the United Arab Emirates, I think that's important to kind of get into those spaces. China, in Abu China's Dhabi, a tough though, one. in Abu Dhabi, I don't think most people watch this though. And I caught it, and uh, I actually commented on Twitter. But uh, if you watch, there was no booze. There was no like. There's no booze. There's no, you know, Ric Flair woos. There's none of that. It was just all like respecting watching that. The only time people booed is when the women fought. Because in Abu Dhabi, it's a cultural thing. You're not supposed to, yeah. The, the it's a cultural here. thing. And that's the thing is like, even though they did that, they have to be careful. Because there's people that, if you watch the film again when the girls fought, the guys would look down. They would look up and then look back down. There was a, a reported, uh, there was a reported store in Abu Dhabi that had American television on, they were selling some, some merchandise. And the store, you know, ended up having the, the TV on, it was showing American television, and then it, it switched over to a commercial with a girl in a bikini. I couldn't tell you which one. But everyone freaked out, and they shut the entire store down. Like, you're done. You got to take it out. Because that's it's a cultural thing, and you have to respect culture when you're over there, because if you don't, then you start closing doors or you start, you know, making the wrong people mad. And if you make the wrong people mad, then that can alter your it's success. Crazy. Hey, this is crazy. I know. Uh, random. I had to look this shit up. Yeah, but yeah. Your boy. Yeah. Ronaldo has got 182 million. Fucking what does followers. that compare to the rock? It's fucking crazy. That's so the rock actually comes in. Uh, he's tied for third with um, Selena Gomez uh, for 156 million. And who's in second? Ariana Grande. Ariana Grande. Fucking Whatever happened Ariana to uh, Grande, 164. Jesus. What happened to Cole Kardashian or the the little sister? What's her name? So Kim is right behind the rock. Kim is at 147, and then Kylie Kim. Kylie Jenner is at 145. So Kylie Jenner, I actually heard whenever she releases a product, uh, like a new like lip gloss product or some makeup deal, that when she posts it out, all these people try to buy it. That all of her servers and website crash because so oh, many, yeah, so making, much flow. They're killing it. They're killing the game. Um, that's crazy, Q. That's crazy. I yeah, I know. That's why I, I had to look it up. Social like, media is bananas like that. How it's changed the game. It's just absolutely bananas. Uh, here's a good question. One more good question for you, and this will this will lead into the next thing. Someday when you're not competitively fighting, where do you see it going? So that's what I'm doing right now. As you see, as we talked about it, that I'm I'm shaking hands and uh, kissing babies. You know, uh, I'm over here trying to build myself and build a career outside of fighting. You know, this is a good platform to help build the name of Julian Marquez and the brand of Julian Marquez. So, you know, I love fighting and I, I want to continue fighting. But there's a time where things have to alter and things change to where, you know podcasting would be awesome if you can have a podcast where you get all these athletes or you know these different influential people to come in and talk to them about their their lives kind of like what we're doing here i think you're a natural to be doing something like that a natural to be doing some some type of commentating um it just fits you it's yeah. just perfect for you you just need the right avenue yeah, and that's that's what I'm trying to do right now. And I'm training and practicing. Like, you know, like we're gonna talk about the grind real quick. I actually have a podcast, a whole entire podcast set up, two mics, the whole nine yards. I have it hooked up to my computer, everything. And I'll sit there and watch fights every weekend, and I'll have the mute on, and I'll sit there and and do, 
on-site commentary about to people and try to keep myself entertained as I talk. Like, I'm not talking to anyone else but myself. And I sit there and watch the, the fights, and I just record it. I don't put it out anywhere. I just get the repetition to, to find my voice, to find myself. And I do that with different fights. You name the fight, I, I'll sit there and write up something, pull it up on UFC Five Pass, ESPN Plus, and I'll sit there and commentate throughout the whole fight. Oh, you know, right now we have Habib Nurmagomedov, who's coming out on 27-0, and about to try to make it 27 or 28-0, and he's going against Dustin Poirier. Dustin Poirier came up from lightweight, and I would sit there and commentate through that whole entire fight and sit there and tell everybody my point of view of what I see and what I think Dustin Poirier needs to do. And I actually grow that up, and I haven't released it anywhere. But when I go and do these, you know, events like work at Tough Enough or work with FFC and do these free gigs where I'm getting more reps in live action, it, it's stuff that helps me build myself up. So eventually one day, five, six, seven years down the road, I can get that call and I can sit there and be a Michael Bisbing mm. or a Chael Sonnen or uh, Megan O'Leavy or Joe Rogan and sit there on the side and, and commentate on the UFC and, and put myself in the name. So hey John, that's a good question about Dom. You see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you used Dom the Hypnotist? Yeah, I have. I've used Dom the Hypnotist. Really? I did. I was one of his uh one of his first people, uh, I would have to say. I think it, to be honest, I was the snowball effect, and I'm not like sitting there bragging, but I was the snowball effect. He did uh we did a, a session at the UFC Performance Institute as we were coming down the stairs and I felt rejuvenated, it felt good, it felt different. And then I came down, turned the corner, and I saw my buddy Khalil Roundtree. And Dom was with me, and uh, I introduced him too, and I kind of told Cleo what it was up, uh, what it was about. And Dom, being the great, you know, marketer himself, he connected himself with Khalil, which Khalil ended up, uh, you know, w using him and having the fight against Eric Anders. I, I want to take credit for coining the name, Dom the Hypnotist, because Q, when he was in here, he had some other crazy name. Remember? It was like ninjutsu mind alteration. And then I was like, <laughs> like, you remember? And I was like, nah, dude, you're Dom the Hypnotist. You know, what's what's real cool, man, is like, you know how it is? Like, if it wasn't for me, and I'm not, I shouldn't say if it wasn't no, for me. No, take credit. Fuck but it. if it wasn't for that, that moment to get him on Khalil, which Khalil got on Joe Rogan, which Eric Anders ended up reaching out to me to work with Dom, then it just snowball effect to get him more of these athletes. That if it wasn't for me, I wouldn't have been in that right place Dude, at the right you, time for you that. Don't, you don't but at the same time as help. you, the same time as you, you wouldn't have saved his name because if he would have been chosen the name that he wanted to go with instead of Don the Hypnotist, which flows way, way better, better. It's and it's simple. so smooth, it was like you know he needs because help. I always look at it like this, Julian, and I went through this with Tony. Right, Tony doesn't regret this because it's the name of his business, but he and I have talked about this. When he first was like, there was always that, that turning point. He goes around, he's real world tactical. People don't know him as Tony. Yeah. So he has to go around, I'm Tony, real world tactical. You know, he says, Oh, you say Tony tactical? Yeah, like whatever. Like Tony, real world tactical. But, you know, he has another page, Tony Semina, but it's, uh, you know, it, it, he kind of always flip flops. Like he's like, I sometimes I wish I used my name, you know, at time. But now he's no, like people know him enough now, he's transcended. But like with Dom, I'm like, dude, you have, like I've said this all the time. I hate guys that don't use their name in some way. Yeah. I get it if it's your business, but like, dude, you're Dom the Hypnotist. Like, that's what you are. Yeah, you're not working for a company. You're creating your own like, company. Like, if you own so a sub shop, know. you're Joey Salami. Like, that's yeah, who you are. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you have, to, you have to use your name so people actually know, oh, you're actually Dom. Oh, you're the guy that Like, it's really easy for me about. when people say, what's the name of your podcast? What's the name on Instagram? Is it, it's my name. You know what I mean? It's simple. It's, yeah. it's easy. Joe Rogan experience? Yeah, it's simple. I, I think people overcomplicate it, and they're like, I want to be, you know, um, the mind-altering ninja specialist. Yeah. And I'm like, Dude, that's what? too many syllables, uh, buddy. I'm like, what is that? But, but when he was in here, you remember a cue I said, Dom the Hypnotist. And it just kind of stuck. And it was, like, simple. Yeah. But yeah. I'm taking credit for that. Fuck it. Yeah, take 100% take credit. <laughs> you saved him. You know, Dom, it's funny. When you, you guys had him on here and you heard a story, like, you got to remember, Dom went all in on this. Mm -hmm. And it, it, does it work? Yeah. If you want it to work, it will work. Yeah, if you believe and, in it, it will work. And I want to ask true. you about that. that I want to get into that because, we, you know, before we wrap, and, and we'll have you back on and we'll be able to do more, but I've said this before and I've been critical of this. I've been around a lot of jujitsu gyms and everything. I sit with a lot of young guys. 
And you're a forward thinker, and that's what I love about you. You're progressive. I think too many guys go all in in a sense that they don't, like, they just think from A to B. They don't think A, B to C to D. And I sit with guys, and they're young guys on the mat, and they'll talk, and they'll be like, I'm going to be a professional UFC fighter, and I'm going to be a world champion. I think that's great, Julian. I think that's great. Goals. Goals. But I also, like, get a little scared when I hear them. I'm like, I think that's awesome, and every story ends that way with a champ, and they're like, that's what I dreamed, da 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 But they also, if you talk to those people, and I say this, and I'm saying this more to all the young guys, and I want to get your thoughts. Have that goal. That's a great goal. But build out something else, too. Build out something else. You're a great networker, too. You love that. You love the human interaction, okay? I look at guys like Connor. Connor's a great showman. You can put Connor anywhere. He's a showman. He could sell anything. He could sell a fucking circus to anybody. You have to have something else. But again, I struggle with this and I go back and forth. There's seasons for everything. What what would advice would you give to the young guy that's like I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna be the UFC world champion and that's what I'm gonna be and they're 19 years old and they've been training for eight months. So you always have to have a, a plan B. You, your life can be altered in any way, shape, or form. I mean, you can get hit by a car, a lightning bolt can strike you, or uh, one move could rip out your your ligaments in your leg, and you have to find some sort of income. So if you want to be the champion, by all means, you can. You're, you're young enough. You're, you're starting out. Even at an older age, you can find a different, you know, you can still make, you know, revenue. I mean, look at Yoel Romero. Yoel Romero came over at 32-something years old. And he's still like he's still doing good. So you can do what you can do it, but it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of struggle. But you also have to understand that you have to create something outside of it. Like you have to find some sort of niche that helps you build up, or you're going to be working for the man the rest of your life. And you don't really want to do that. You don't want to be a server for the rest of your life. You have to find something. Yeah, and some guys are firemen. Some guy, you know, don't be afraid to have yeah. that second thing you love. If you love cooking, I don't care. But some of the, you know, I believe in laser focus, but some guys scare me because the UFC is growing and it's it's getting very big and it's getting com ultra competitive. I mean, I think that goes without saying. Yeah. So don't be a one trick pony. Build out some other things. You know, well, look at it like this: if you were to start up, let's just say, if you from who you are right now, if you were to start up uh, like MMA and fighting, and say you were 19 years old. My advice to you would be like, all right, well, what do you love? All right, are you uh, a comedian? Are you a, you know, you're you're a gun guy, or are you um, are are you good at whatever it may be, marketing? And then you you keep focusing on that as you're sitting there building yourself in your MMA career, build yourself in the knowledge outside of something else, to where when it comes down to it, you will be a black belt in MMA, but you'll black be a black belt in the knowledge of whatever else you have yeah, and you, you have create a to, business. I would say definitely at the most basic level, you have to learn how to market yourself. Too. I mean, look at this. Like even today, there is a kid out there that is making, he's like five, six years old that unravels on YouTube different products and toys and everybody <laughs> loves it. And I his talk about family, the toy kid all the time. Yo, his family like literally quit work and they manage his company, his money, it's his name. And like, and they, they pay themselves a salary. You know what I mean? Like you can, there's, you can find stuff. You know, people are lazy. People want education. People want to understand it, but the shortest way possible. How do you create something that people want? They want humor. You sit there and create a channel. They want knowledge. You create a podcast. They want information. You write a blog. You know, or, or they want to know who you are and what you're about and the funny things you do, create a vlog. You know, like... So I'm, I'm real excited to have you in here at KVAR and Arsenal and, and get you to kind of bounce around the studio a little bit. I'm going to get you to look at some AKs, maybe take a few glamour shots. Um, you know, where do you feel, you know, this being a defense podcast, where do you feel that, you know, um, MMA fits in the whole spectrum of self-defense? you get excited when... You know, you get people that are just in it for training sake or like you see women now training self-defense. You you know, where to where to firearm self-defense, everything. Where How does it all collide for you? So me, you know, I'm I'm a novice when it comes to knowing about guns or anything about it. You know, I went hunting a couple of times with a shitty gun and I killed absolutely nothing because I had a terrible gun. Do I know what gun it was? No, nah, not at all. But, you know, where it all fits in is that like. The thing is, is that 
everything is evolving. Back, you know, 50 years ago, people would sit there and shoot. You know what I mean? They, they'd have their little tactics. Now, again, you're going hand-to-hand -hand combat. You're learning different style of approach that, you know, self-defense. Like if, if, a, if a guy comes up to a girl and grabs a hold of them, you know, you have your jujitsu or you just pull out your side piece to defend yourself, which in today's day and age, you need to defend yourself in one way or you another. You got to have a little bit of everything. Yeah, you have to. And the thing is, is that, you know, you can't just buy a gun and think that you're a professional. You know, no. you, you don't know what it is. You want to make sure that, you know, you're doing the right things if you so happen to have to pull that firearm on somebody. So if you if you go in a fight with somebody and the first thing you do is pull your gun and then you shoot that person and wound them in any way, shape or, sh way, way, shape or form, it's like that looks bad. But if you go in there and you pick this dude up and beat the crap out of him and then he pulls a gun on you, but you had one and you can disarm him and hold the gun to withhold them then yeah like there's probably different ways that you, you, can go. you gotta train up you gotta train up man but you need to learn how to control your mind and by going through the jiu-jitsu you're going to be put in a position or going through you know uh like self-defense seminars or stuff you're going to be putting yourself in a repetition of uh that position where you're uncomfortable or where you literally have no hope or no choice to where you're you can be calm and you can think in those positions i like that so tell everybody where they can find you. Tell everybody the best place to reach you. Pull up the pages, Q. All right. You can find me on all social media platforms. It is J Marquez MMA, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, um, Snapchat. I don't have um, a MySpace anymore. Or I, I might. I don't know where My it's face. at. MySpace. But, uh, you know, and uh, that, that's pretty much where you can find me. I do have a YouTube channel called Juju State of Mind where I do coffee talks. Um, fight reviews, and I find a little bit about the personality of the the host or guest that I am uh, having a conversation with. I like that. Juju state of mind. I think there's something there. You should come out with t-shirts. Sooner or later. Sooner or later. Sooner or later. So if anyone wants to reach out to you, slide into the DM, slide in appropriately. Um, oh, please, please. We yeah. can have good stories. We yeah. can get to that one. There's some good stories. Um, we're going to have you back on. I yeah. want to have you back on at some point. Uh, I want to get you over to take some some photos, check out the guns. I want to show you some cool stuff, show you what we're doing here. Uh, I've had a blast having you on. Ah, I had Seriously. a blast being here. Thank yeah. you very much. No, it's been a long, it's been an hour and 20 minutes, believe it or not. So oh, we're having fun. Yeah, we're having a good time. I'm looking forward to this. I'm, uh, where are you going to be next? Where can people find you? Um, I mean, right now, I just got an offer to go do uh, NASCAR some right? NASCAR gig. And uh, I get to sit there and create a, a NASCAR. Um, I can't release the name of the driver that I have until I get full confirmation. But we're going to be doing a, a video shoot tomorrow, followed by Saturday or Friday. I'll be at the NASCAR event. So if you find me there, come shake hands. Uh, let's talk. Let's take a photo. Let's build each other up. And then, um, but other than that, I'm You're always, always at, lurking around the PI. Yeah. You're at the Contender Series. So yeah. if you see Julian around, go say hello. Come to Top Golf. I'm going to be at Top Golf. I will serve you free waters, ice on the rocks. All the water you can drink. I love it there. I love it there. We got to go sometime. No, I'm, I'm there for uh, Action Targets does a deal there. I'm always there uh, for action. The, the, that's Shot Show. I'll be there. But uh, I love Top Golf. That's so much fun. So much fun there. Yeah. But yeah, definitely slide into Julian's DM if you're looking to uh, connect or if you're in the Vegas area and you want to check him out. Uh, Go to his page, too. Leave a like and a follow. But uh, I want to thank everybody. Make sure you like and subscribe. Make sure you tune in. Uh, let's show Julian some guns. Q, take us off.